Well, welcome to another Friday night. We're continuing our little series on the subconscious brain, which I hope you're finding helpful. And to me, you can't really understand complex trauma unless you understand the role of the subconscious brain, how powerful it is, how important it is to do, as Carl Jung said, to bring that whole subconscious to the conscious level if you want to get healthy, if you want to change. Because as long as it remains hidden, it's going to continue to dominate and run your life and you're going to end up with all these templates that are unhealthy based on the complex trauma that are going to result in you doing things that hurt yourself, hurt, hurt others that are unhealthy. And it all comes out of the complex trauma. And so it's realizing that complex trauma creates hidden templates inside of us that determine our behavior, our thinking, our emotions, and they were necessary and formed when a child was in a dangerous situation and it's what they needed to do to survive, but it's what became their normal. And it became a subconscious template in the brain and that is what needs to come to a conscious level if they're going to change. So what I want to do today is really tell you a story but it's to illustrate one of the most common and damaging templates that most people come under complex trauma don't even realize they have it. But until they do, what's going to happen is they're going to end up in relationship after relationship that's going to do more and more damage to themselves. They're just going to keep going back into relationships that end up being complex trauma situations and it's going to do them a ton of damage and their kids. And so the whole goal of today is to bring this very subtle, powerful, hidden, common template to the conscious level so that you can see it and go, oh, that's what's going on here hopefully so that you can change. It's not an attempt to try to beat anybody up to make you feel guilty. It's an attempt to bring this very subtle hidden template that is so common to the conscious level. And the template really goes like this. If anything is wrong in a situation, it must be my fault. So a child coming up in complex trauma, they blame themselves for their parents' flaws. That's what I want you to understand. They think that if their parent is unhappy, then they, the child, has done something wrong. And if they would just change something in their behavior, then the parent would be happy. Things would be going so much better in the family. It all depends on them changing their behavior. So everything is dependent on them. And if anything's not working, it's their fault. They are the ones that need to do something different. That is so common within complex trauma. And I'm going to explain it in a minute. What comes out of that, as you can see, is a person goes into adult relationships and all of a sudden they're in a bad relationship and they just think, I need to change. It must be my fault. I must be doing something wrong. And then if their parents are still in conflict with them, their parents still aren't meeting their needs, then they're going, it must be my fault. I must be doing something wrong. If I just change this, then my parents will love me. Then my parents will meet my needs. And they spend years and years changing, 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 changing themselves. And nothing gets better overall. But they can't see that it's the parents, it's the partner that's got the issues that aren't willing to change. They keep thinking, I need to be doing something, there's something I'm doing wrong. And so many people stay in abusive relationships, controlling relationships for years and years and do so much damage to themselves and their children because they operate by this template, it must be my fault. I must be doing something wrong. And so I have seen this in thousands of clients and it is heartbreaking. And that's why I want to talk about it is so that people begin to see what is really going on here. So let's go back and understand how this template develops in complex trauma. So complex trauma is about a child's needs not being met or a child experiencing pain. 
needs not being met, that's painful, that's uncomfortable, that's something that doesn't feel right. Getting hurt, abused, neglected, that's painful. And so the brain doesn't like pain. The brain then goes looking for a solution. But in a child, the brain operates from an egocentric perspective. And so it assumes my needs aren't being met. I am getting hurt because I'm doing something wrong. It's my fault. If I adapt, if I change my behavior, that will fix the problem. And so that's how a child's brain is wired. That's how it works. And so a child changes their behavior. What can then happen is three different things can happen that causes the child to think they did the right things. So the first is every time their parent is upset, the parent distorts reality and presents lies to them, but the child thinks, well, it's my parent, they must be telling me the truth, this must be the facts, and so they believe the parent. So the dad said, I'm angry because you're such a bad kid. It's your fault that I'm so upset. You are the one that makes me so depressed. If only you could be like your brother, then things would be so much better around here. Those are all distortions. But the child believes, because the parents are telling them, it must be the truth. And so, okay, it's my fault. So that's number one. Number two, often when they change, the situation does improve for a little while. They make an adaptation, they do something different, and dad's not so angry, mom's not so depressed. And they go, oh, okay, see, that proves it was my fault. It's me that's the one that needs to change. So they've got kind of validation through improvement of circumstances. Thirdly, sometimes they'll actually get verbal validation from mom and dad when they make a change and go, oh, that was so nice of you. That is so wonderful that you do that. And so all of a sudden they get another reinforcement that this is right. This is what you should do when there's problems in a relationship. It's your fault. You're the one that needs to change. So you can see that overall nothing's going to actually change because mom and dad aren't dealing with their issues. And so there's going to continue to be problems which are going to continue to be the norm and the child is going to begin to feel this is my normal and but they're still going to feel I need to be the one that changes. It's my fault. And so that is going to continue. Now, let me just stop and say this. The kind of home where this happens has mom and dad, people in authority who really are abusing that authority. They're acting as narcissists. They are basically saying that Everything needs to suit me. I don't need to change my behavior. Everybody else needs to change their behavior. It's all about everybody giving up their rights, giving up their needs to make me feel good. That's what's going on here. A narcissist running a home. So what I want you to see is that's actually creating a second template within the child, which is getting used to living with a narcissist learning how to be comfortable with a narcissist, to try to manage a narcissist, to try to get a narcissist to meet your needs. And so living with a narcissist, relating to a narcissist is becoming their normal. And that creates a, a second template which can be very dangerous later on. So let's move ahead to their teen years, early 20s, that many children often begin to go, hey, this isn't all my fault. Dad's got anger issues. Mom needs to deal with her stuff. Mom's got an addiction issue. It, it's their stuff. And so they start to challenge some of the behavior in the household. They challenge dad on their anger. And, and they get in mom's face about stuff. And they stop. They threaten to stop caring for dad's emotions and changing just so dad's happy again. What happens because of that? Well, it creates more anger in dad. It creates more problems in the household. Things get worse. There's tension all the time now because now you've got somebody who's not playing by the rules, somebody that's not going along with the dynamics that have been in place for years in the household, somebody who's pointing out that it's not the child's fault. 
So what does the rest of the family do when there's this increase in tension now and dad's even more angry? Well, instead of validating the child saying, yes, you're right, they usually confront that rebel child and say, hey, you're making things worse around here. You got to stop doing that. And they make it the child's fault again. But then they go, what you need to do is you need to submit. You need to conform. If you would just conform and go along with the rules and do things the way it's always been done, we'd make dad happy again. We wouldn't have all this anger. And it looks like a really good solution. Just conform, just give in, and dad will be happy. And that's what they present to the child. And so the child does what is expected of them, and dad does seem to be happy for a little while until he's triggered again and blows up. But initially, their advice and following their advice to submit and conform back to the old dynamics seems to work, seems to be right. It reinforces the template that, see, this problem in the family was your fault that you rebelled, that you pointed stuff out. But over time, the child begins to learn that when they do submit and conform, it makes things better for a little while, but always dad blows up again. It doesn't resolve the problem. The the issue is still dad's anger. And so they realize that this submit conform to the way things have always been doesn't ultimately work. It's only a short-term solution that makes peace for a little while, but it's just really making things worse. And so the child begins maybe to think at a little deeper level and they go, what's the big picture of what's going on here? Because this I don't think is fair. What I see here is a family where dad can be selfish. Everybody else has to give up their rights, their needs. Everybody else has to make sacrifices. It's not a family of equals. It's a family where dad's in the superior position and everybody else serves him and gives it up. That's not fair. That's not love. This is not a loving household. This is a household in fear, trying to do a dance to keep the person in authority happy. That's not the household that I want. More than that, this is a household operating by a double standard. That dad can have one set of rules, but everybody else has a different set of rules. And I don't think that's healthy either to have relationships where there's double standard. And so the child begins to see through that, but the child stays in the household. So a couple of things can happen as the child continues on living in these circumstances that nothing is really changing. Dad is still not looking at his stuff. Mom's not looking at her stuff. And so all of the same dynamics are still continuing the way they always have. Every time the teenage young adult child resists and gets angry about it, and points out what's really going on, the family gangs up and gaslights that child. And they use all kinds of distorted arguments to say, no, it's your fault because you're resisting, you're being rebellious, you're not conforming. If you just conformed, everything would be okay. And so they're constantly being gaslit. That, over time can result in that child beginning to gaslight themselves. They beginning to second guess themselves and go, maybe I am the problem. Maybe I am too pig headed. Maybe I am too opinionated. Maybe I am too rebellious. Maybe I just need to conform and submit more. And they start to gaslight themselves and second guess themselves. And nothing becomes clear anymore. That's a dangerous place. And sometimes what people need at that point in time is a third party, and often it's one of their children, who comes with an innocence, who can come and just see things accurately and call it the way it really is to finally break through all of the distorted logic and lies that they've been told by other family members for years. So that's kind of the theory part of it. So let me go to telling you a story. And I'm going to borrow a story that basically comes from Nadine Burke Harris's book, The Deepest Well, that just came out. 
But it's really a story that I'm compiling from hundreds and hundreds of clients that I have dealt with over my years in this work. But the point is understanding the underlying templates that are operating throughout this story. So what I'm going to do as I tell this story is I'm going to stop periodically and just teach. And so it's going to kind of be like I'm doing a case study with a bunch of counseling students. So I'm going to go through the story, stop and point out, make some observations. So again, in telling this story, for some of you, it may trigger a whole bunch of stuff. It might trigger shame. It might go, oh, I'm so stupid. Why didn't I see this? I don't want you to beat yourself up. This is not the point of the story. The point of the story is to help you see how subtle this template is. Bring it to the surface, to the conscious level, so that you can begin to go, wow, that's what's happening with me. Okay, now I see what I need to change. So I'm really hoping that this will lead to positive insight for you, positive self-awareness and change. So let me begin with the story. In the 1990s, Jessica developed some software that became a huge success and launched Jessica's career. So she dropped out of university and started a software company to develop and license the software. And it became very successful. It was through that work that she met a man named Brad, who was tall, handsome, and super intense. Jessica was drawn to Brad's passion for politics and science and loved how he could wax philosophical for hours about what he saw as inevitable future in which artificial, artificial intelligence saves the world. Now let me stop and make initial observations. Jessica was uneasy with Brad's intensity in the very beginning. He was constantly wanting to be with her. He talked very deep, intense all the time. Now it felt good to her to be desired so passionately by somebody because she had not had that growing up. But something in her gut was uncomfortable with this constantly wanting to be with her, constantly going deep. But she was afraid to set a boundary with Brad because he might get upset and he might not like her and he might dump her. And so she ignored her gut. Now that is another template that develops for many people in complex trauma. And that is to start ignoring your gut. When you are around people who are unhealthy and you're feeling something's off here, this is uncomfortable, you ignore it. Why? because you're told you should, or because your longing to be loved is so deep that it overpowers your gut. And you go, I'd rather have his attention and him chasing me, even though it doesn't feel quite right. I just want to be longed for. Back to the story. Things move quickly. And within a few months, they were living together. Soon they were married. And for the most part, it was wonderful. But after a few years, Jessica felt that something was off. Something didn't feel quite right, but she couldn't put her finger on it. Now, what I want you to see as we go through this story is that Jessica's grown up in the West. And so she's operating on kind of the beliefs of our culture about what makes a person healthy, what makes a relationship healthy and successful. And so she's operating off a set of beliefs that are actually faulty, but she doesn't know that. Nobody's ever told that. She's just grown up in that. And everybody just assumes that this is the way it should be. And so what are some of those beliefs? That what makes a good husband is he's smart, he's good looking, he's a good worker. That's all you need. That's what makes a, a good husband. And he passionately wants you, so he must be in love with you. Secondly, as long as your career is going well and things are developing financially and you're getting ahead in life, you're successful. And that means you're doing stuff correctly. So when she's feeling that something is off, she doesn't know what to, how to look at that. She has no other way to think about that off feeling than 
what her culture has told her. Oh, things must be okay. Just ignore that off feeling because look at you got a great guy who really likes you. You got a good career. Things are great. She has no other template to examine the deeper life that she's experiencing. And that's, you're going to see over and over again. Okay, back to this story. So when she found out that she was pregnant, that first moment of realization wasn't what Jessica always imagined it would be. She didn't squeal and rush to tell Brad. In fact, she thought about not telling him at all. She even considered leaving before her pregnancy began to show, breaking it off with Brad and moving out. This urge felt like both a betrayal, but somehow the right thing to do. Still in her 20s, Jessica had started a company and was on the way to some serious success. This was where her life was, and besides, she did love Brad. Observation. She goes back to old beliefs and feelings. So again, this uncomfortable feeling that something's off is getting stronger. But she doesn't know what to do with it. So she ignores it and goes back to old feelings. I love Brad. I have warm feelings to Brad. So love is a limbic brain, warm feeling. So that must mean we're in love. My career is going well. Everything in my life is going well. So things must, I must be doing stuff right. Thirdly, I've chosen this relationship, this man. I've chosen to get pregnant. I've chosen this life, so I need to man up and be a responsible person and quit feeling sorry for myself and quit looking for an out. All of that was put into her growing up, and that's what she falls back on because she doesn't know where else to go. Next, when things were great, they were really great. It just didn't feel like things had been that great lately. When Jessica told Brad about the baby, he was sweet and excited. During her pregnancy, he would rub her belly as they lay in bed and say, just imagine a little boy for me to build, ro build robots with. He helped her leave her, her enormous belly out of chairs and brought her water to make sure she stayed hydrated. But after David was born, things changed. Brad quickly became frustrated that Jessica was giving all her energy and attention to the baby. Jessica understood this change of regime had to be hard for her husband. He'd been dethroned pretty rapidly from being the only person in her life. Soon, the smallest things became epic arguments. Now, what I want you to see is that Brad, because of this baby coming into the scene, is being triggered and automatically is showing signs of being a narcissist. He doesn't want anybody else stealing his throne, stealing attention from him. He wants to be the center of attention. He feels threatened by this little baby and he gets angry. And so now what you're going to see is he's going to ask her to make small little adaptations to make him happy. But each adaptation, she's going to have to give up more and more of her rights, become more and more unhealthy in order to suit Brad. So we got a narcissist now that's been triggered, and now you're going to see all of the fallout that comes from that. So here's what begins to happen. Brad's drinking es escalated dramatically after the baby was born. He had always been a partier, but after David arrived, things went off a cliff. Soon he was having issues at work and was fired from a string of jobs. As the months went by, it seemed to Jessica that she spent more time figuring out how to avoid fights with Brad than enjoying his company. Everything set him off. And then he refused to help take care of David. So when she went back to work, they had to get a full-time nanny because... Brad wouldn't help out. So what you can see is, boy, this guy, because now he's not the center of attention, he's not being fed as a narcissist the way he wants to be fed, he is acting out in all kinds of very immature ways. Drinking, losing jobs, not taking care of the baby, arguing all the time, picking fights. 
He's becoming more narcissistic. He's accepting no responsibility for his behavior. He is making it all on Jessica that she's not giving him enough time. She's not being loving. She's not being a good wife. And so and Jessica, instead of confronting the real problem, she goes to, must be my fault. I need to change. She goes to avoid making him up. Set. So what does that mean? Give up more rights, give up more needs, make more sacrifices. She sees Brad's problem behavior as a problem to solve, not as a sign that this is a very unhealthy person. What have I gotten myself into? I need to get out of this or else I'm going to be in big trouble. She goes, I got to be able to figure out a way to get Brad to change. That is where this template takes people. And then you stay on in a relationship trying all these different options to get him to be happier, to get him to not argue so much. But it doesn't end. Brad resented when Jessica talked on the phone with her dad. And when she finally found a moment to get out of the house and have lunch with a girlfriend, Brad was furious. So now... It's not just that she can't talk to their son or have a relationship with their son. She can't have a relationship with her dad. She can't have any girlfriends. Despite how angry he constantly was at her, Brad didn't want Jessica to be very far from him. So he still acts loving. I just want you. I just want us to be close. I just want us to be doing stuff together. So she's getting mixed messages. You can have nobody else in your life but me. And I want you. I want you. I love you. At first, he just moped when she spent solo time with friends and family, but it wasn't long before he was giving her ultimatums. It's them or me. You got to make a choice. You can only have me in a relationship, and if you don't want that set up, you want other people in your relationship, then you can't have me. And so eventually, Jessica decided it was easier to avoid the drama altogether and just stay home and watch TV with Brad. Give in to him. Give him what he wants. Just him. Cut off all other relationships. And it seemed to work because he seemed happier. See again what's going on here? This is progressively getting worse, but she's not seeing the big picture. All she is thinking is, I just need to give in to his demands because he makes them sound reasonable and that means I got to adapt a little bit more and get a little bit more unhealthy and not have friends and not have other relationships and just isolate with him and make him the center of my world. That that sounds like it's going to work, so I'll do it. But she doesn't see that she's feeding a monster. She's enabling him to remain an unhealthy, sick narcissist and it's getting worse. So she's only thinking from her limbic brain in terms of short-term peace, keeping Brad happy. She's not thinking in terms of long-term, what this is going to do over time, that is actually going to get worse. And she doesn't have the understanding that a healthy relationship requires two healthy people working on themselves and getting healthy. She just thinks she's the one that needs to change. So... She then has to start making excuses to her girlfriends for why she can't go out with them. And that happens all the time. So now she's making excuses for her behavior, which is getting more unhealthy. She's making excuses for her husband. One evening, when David was about six months old, Jessica and Brad were in the kitchen making dinner when something happened that set him off. She would never forget the sound of Brad screaming at the top of his lungs, slamming cabinet doors. Jessica shrank into silence and fear. She knew better than to try to argue. And for about 30 seconds after he stopped yelling, the entire kitchen was quiet. Then from the breakfast nook, little David let out a wail. When Jessica looked at her son, His face was beet red and he was letting out the shrieking, gasping cries that rips at any mother's heart. Jessica wondered how the hell she had gotten to this place. 
On the surface, things appeared to be going well. Her job was doing great, but at home, things were becoming awful. The sound of garage door opening, announcing David's arrival, would set her heart pounding, and when she heard his keys jangling at the front door, she would brace herself for what might be coming next. You can see that Jessica is now living in a complex trauma environment. She is constantly on edge, constantly on fear, constantly on guard, always feeling in danger. So she, all of this has brought about a complex trauma environment. You can also see that it's been gradual. Things have gradually just gotten a bit worse, bit worse. But as it's gotten worse, it's required her to adapt, but not in healthy ways, but to become more unhealthy herself. So in order to try and keep the sick narcissist happy, she's had to become sicker and sicker herself. But she can't see it. So she thinks that all she needs to do is to try try to change something and it's going to fix everything. So it's still all on her to figure out what needs to change. It must be something she's not figured out yet, something she's not doing right. So she knew there had to be a way to manage the situation. She just hadn't figured it out yet. In the rare moments of connection and tenderness with Brad, she would gently ask him why they fought so much. This can't be normal, can it? He had one of two reactions whenever she brought up the possibility that something was wrong. When he was in a bad mood, he would go off on a diatribe about how all her friends were against him He'd say they were just jealous because he and Jessica loved each other so much while their own marriages were boring and passionless. If he was in a playful mood, he would tease her about being a typical woman worrying about relationships. He'd compliment her saying that she was too smart to get caught up in some romantic comedy-induced delusion that there's a perfect relationship out there. He'd call her babe and say that this was just the way love worked out in the real world. You laughed and you screamed sometimes. Either way, you knew the other person loved you, so you gutted it out. This is a form of gaslighting. He's not open to an open conversation about all the possible reasons why they're fighting so much. What he wants to do is not explore what's wrong with our relationship. He wants to give her only two options as to what why she's feeling the way she's feeling and keep her from exploring any other options. So he's directing her thinking to where he wants it to go. And basically it's to avoid looking that he might be the problem, that things might need to change. That's gaslighting. And so what is so interesting is here is this brilliant woman who's got her own career her own company making seven-figure income, and she's not able to see that she's being lied to, she's being tricked, that there's other picture here than the little picture that her husband is presenting to her. But that's what happens when a person stays in an abusive-type relationship and is gaslit, is they gradually conform their thinking to match the thinking of the narcissist because that's the way to keep peace. And they block out and deny all other gut feelings, all other ideas about what might be wrong. Shortly after little David turned three, the family moved from the center of town to a new home, a big house that was as secluded as it was beautiful. The live-in nanny who had been taking care of David since he was born was unable to move with them. Up until that point, David had been a confident, happy kid. He would run up to strangers on the street and exuberantly shout, Hi, I'm David. But after the move, Jessica noticed that David became withdrawn and shy. Now, all of the marriage issues are now going to start to affect the child. But she's going to ignore it. She's not going to look at it in terms of Our marriage problems and dad's issues are what are causing my child's problems. She's going to go to, oh, I wonder what's wrong with my son. Maybe he's got a sickness. Maybe he's got some issue that I need to take him to the doctor for. 
she's not able to think in that bigger picture. Soon they were getting calls from his nursery school. His teachers complained that he had started hitting other kids in class. By his fourth birthday, the school had had enough. They insisted that Jessica and Brad take David to be evaluated for ADHD. Jessica was worried. In addition to his short fuse at school, she noticed that David had become quick to cry and tantrum at home. More concerning, he was suddenly getting sick all the time. They were referred by their pediatrician to a top clinic for ADHD assessment where David was seen by a seasoned clinician. He evaluated David and his parents together, then spent some time with David alone. While the four-year-old played tentatively with one of the medical assistants nearby, the doctor took Jessica and Brad, told Jessica and Brad what he had observed. Look, this is going to be hard to hear, but your child is lacking the protections of childhood, he said. What does that mean? Jessica asked. He's being exposed to psychological trauma. He needs a more peaceful, less stressful environment. We believe that is what's contributing to his ADHD. For Jessica, the part of the conversation that would haunt her later was also the part that Brad was unable to, con- to accept. And that was that their son was being exposed to psychological trauma. That's what the doctor had said, but Brad ignored everything except the doctor said he has ADHD. That's all that Brad cared about. And he was great about giving little David his Ritalin, but he said the rest of what the doctor said was bullshit. While some of David's teachers were happy with his new behavior because it was more manageable, Jessica was disturbed because now her son was totally zombified all the time because of the medication. This, you can see, is just progressively going downhill. Now their son acting out. Now their son having health problems. But nobody's saying, is it because of stress in the home? When a doctor actually says it's because of stress in the home, the husband says, nah, that part's bullshit. He's just got ADHD and needs a pill. What I want you to see is that Jessica believes her husband. She puts more weight in what her husband says than what the doctor says. And part of that is a defense. If I go along with the doctor, my husband's going to get more angry. He's going to put more pressure on me. And I don't want to go through that. So I'll just deny what everybody else is saying and just hang on to what my husband is saying as the truth. So there's a deeper level of denial that sets in. There's a deeper level of I can't look accurately at life. I have to get more and more distorted. So this is where the gaslighting is gone to an even greater extent. And now the lies that the husband is saying get the most weight. Anybody that's telling the truth is suspect they must be telling me lies. Everything is getting backwards. And that is so sad. When Jessica started having what she thought were panic attacks in the middle of the night, she began to wonder if maybe there was a problem. So now at going to a new level, she's starting to experience panic attacks. Maybe this sleepless, heart-pounding thing wasn't about Brad or their relationship. Maybe she just had some health problems. Was she working too much? Did she have some kind of condition? She didn't know, but she needed to fix it. So she went to therapy to try and figure it out. Notice again where her brain went. It had thought maybe this is Brad and relationship related. No, it can't be that. I can't go there. I'm going to just look for a different explanation. It must be maybe I got some health issues going on. So she still goes to the old template of it's got to be me. I can't look at the truth. It's got to be me. And so she's developed this tunnel vision that whenever there's a problem, don't look at a bigger picture. Just try to fix that little symptom. And and there must be something physical about it. The doctor she saw prescribed exercise and time to herself. So you need to do better self-care. She laughed. 
By this time, she was running one company and consulting for another. But the doctor was serious, sir, serious, telling her to book Jessica time into her schedule, just like she would a marketing meeting. He said that she'd be accountable for, to him for that time. He would check in with her about whether or not she kept the meeting with herself. For a while, she tried, dutifully putting it on her calendar, but it didn't work. She'd hijack the time, use it to finish the one project that simply couldn't wait. So a couple things here. First, the doctor is just, oh, okay, yeah, it's you. You just need more you time. No questions asked about home life. No questions asked about other stressors. It's just you're working too hard. That happens so often. But Jessica thinking, I can't do this. I got work to do. I got to be responsible. I'm the main breadwinner. My husband doesn't work any, want to work. Um, and so I got to, I got to be responsible and I need a distraction. I got to keep busy. I got to keep busy. And so back to the old template, it's me that's got to change. It's me that's got to fix things up. This went on for months before her boss finally intervened. Why don't you use my personal trainer? He suggested. I insist. When she saw her boss's face, it dawned on her that perhaps she hadn't been hiding her personal stress as well as she thought. Jessica never knew enough to accept his offer. With her boss's support, Jessica found that it was easier than she had anticipated to squeeze some yoga into her schedule between meetings. Somewhere between tree pose and downward facing dog, she began to feel her stress slowly lifting in waves. Now, what is scary to me about this is that the solution that you need to just do some yoga at, in the office and, and some self-care, it seemed to be helping. And so that just reinforced, see, the problem was just me. I was just too stressed out. I just needed a better health care, self-care regime. For a while, she woke up less and less in the middle of the night, but it wasn't long before her me time became an issue for Brad sparking an epic fight about her selfishness. It didn't matter to him that she was busting her butt as the sole breadwinner for the family. He thought she should spend less time working and more time with David and him and that she should definitely, definitely not be taking time away from the family just so she could try to look good. He began publicly posting his opinions about her online. Jessica was devastated and she felt like a fly stuck in amber. You just see again, there's an elevation now of more control, more abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, gaslighting, it's your fault, you're being selfish, you're neglecting your family, you need to spend more time with us. But she's been tolerating these small incremental increases in control and abuse for years and she's hardly noticing them. But he's also positioning all of his criticism. He's positioning himself as a victim. Look what you're doing to us. We're, we're feeling neglected. And so it seems, yeah, there's maybe some truth to that. It seems. And then his solution seems reasonable. You just need to spend less time on you because you you shouldn't be worrying about how you look. You've got us. Just spend more time with us. It all seems so reasonable. She makes more sacrifices. Another small increment. Nothing she said or did could get Brad to change his behavior. She knew that his rage was terribly harmful for David, but she told herself that after all, Brad had never hit her or David for that matter. She resolved to make sure that David would never be alone in Brad's care. Divorce meant shared custody, and she was petrified at the thought of not being there when David spent time with his father. What if he got drunk and drove with David? What if he flew off the handle and screamed at him? As miserable as she felt, it wasn't about her. She needed to be there for her son, so she would stick it out come hell or high water. See again what's happening here. She's making excuses for her husband. He never hit David. He never hit her. So it can't be that bad. But yet she's starting to think about leaving him and getting a divorce, but she can't quite go there because she feels caught. If she stays, David's going to experience her dad's anger and abuse. But if, if she leaves, 
then she's got to share custody and David's going to have to still go through it. And, and so David's going to get hurt no matter which option she picks. So there's not a good option here, only two bad ones. And so in her mind, it's better if I stay in this relationship to protect my son. It's all about my son. This is the best for my son. So she's still kind of thinking at a very shallow, trying to fix symptoms, trying to help without seeing a bigger picture. So nothing changed. And maybe it wouldn't have if it hadn't been for the unimaginable courage of her seven-year-old son. One day, during a typical blowout, instead of retreating to his bedroom like he usually did when his parents fought, David stood in the doorway and watched as his, as his dad berated his mom. When it was over and his father had left, David went to his mother and took her face in his hands. Mom, he said, looking her straight in the eye, we have to leave. So two years later, David sat, or Jessica sat in a darkened room with six other women watching a video. They were all strangers to her, but they were all mothers who had filed restraining orders against their husband. So this was a court-mandated video that they had to watch. Jessica remembered thinking as she watched that the video's message was what you would expect, that witnessing physical abuse is obviously bad for kids. Everybody knew that, so she's going, why am I watching this stupid video? But what made her sit on the edge of her seat and her hands go numb was what the video had to say next about verbal and emotional abuse. And it said it was just as bad for kids and in some ways it was worse. Jessica began to weep. Years later at her friend's dining room table, Jessica's tears were gone, but her astonishment wasn't. Fifteen years I lived like that, she said, shaking her head, and I thought it was normal. I blamed myself. I thought something was wrong with me all those years. I wish someone had shown me that video when I was in high school. She said that not long after they moved out, she began to see a change. David wasn't so quick to get upset, and he just seemed calmer in general. She took him back to the psychologist, and she and David were now in therapy, both together and separately. But ironically, the things that seemed to make the biggest difference for David were the changes she made for herself. Jessica created more time for her son and for herself. She discovered her love for drawing and painting and ballet. She found herself able to slow down and open up. As she changed and got more healthy, David got better. That's the key thing. So that's the story that I've heard hundreds and hundreds of times. It's heartbreaking. But do you see that she was operating off old template that kids from complex trauma grow up with? That if there's something wrong, it's my fault. And I hope what you can begin to realize is that's the wrong template. Yes, there's times in a relationship when something's wrong, it is my fault and I need to own it. But there are times when it's the other person's fault and they need to own it. And if they don't, if they're a narcissist, then this relationship is never going to work and I need to think of getting out. Well, I hope that helps you. That's the end of our Friday night. I hope you have a great